Uh, so my RTO member, I'm a research fellow um, in the area of quantitative finance. I'm working in the area of credit risk and uh, final year, uh, final year fellow of Department of Management Studies, IIT Madras. So today, today I have come come up with uh, some brief introduction about Archangar. And we have one more session where we would be doing some practical, uh, uh, practical, you know, hands on us. Today I would be taking a little bit uh, uh, on the R model, uh, R coding also for the model so that you will get an uh, introduction about the GARCH mo model and, and how kind of practice that once we are having the practical session so where I would be giving you some data uh, and then trying to look at that whether you are able to implement uh, the model and whether you are able to analyze the data with what we have already studied today. So uh, let us begin with so so uh, in the part one, the presentation is divided into three parts. Part one, which is about the need of heteroscedist uh, model. And then we will talking about a little bit about serial relation, then volatility clustering, and the features of financial time series data. So this is the introduction part that why do we need the heteroscedistic uh, model? Models. We have a time series. Lots of models are available. Why there is a need of arch and garch kind of model, or why there is a need of such kind of modeling in the uh, for the uh, financial time series data. So, if we begin with the introduction, so basically, what is the objective when we go for the conditional heteroscedistic model? So, our objective is to look into the future returns and to analyze the future returns. When we see the past data, so we always try to look for or to predict for the future returns, right? So, in that case, what happened? It's very difficult to understand what would be the future return given the market is very volatile. And when the market is very volatile, it's very difficult for us to predict whether the market will go up or down tomorrow. Uh, based upon the current prices, given the models are available with us. So this, uh, this is for some more sophisticated models. So there the, uh, there the need arises for the conditional heteroscedistic models. So uh, the point is, we what we can observe, we can observe only the historical returns. So, and we wanted to predict the future distributions of the return, maybe, or maybe let's say prices, so what we have, we can only say, uh, we can only look back the historical return. But the point is, so far we we used to make the assumptions that the past, uh, the future distributions of the uh, of the time series, whether it is a return or the stock prices, they are related with the historical uh, historical data. Or you can say that we say uh, you can say that. Our future will be depending upon the past. So, so far, this is the assumptions we we uh, we keep in our mind while predicting the future data, right? But the point is, as you can say, downside. Uh, we have two assumptions. The one is that the future returns are depending upon the historical distribution, but that is not always true. As you can, you might have seen number of times when the uh, when the you know crisis happens in the market, where the in the past the market is going very smoothly, but suddenly suddenly the burst comes. So it's very difficult to uh, you know assess at that time what what was the cause, and then we started working on, and then we understand okay so. This uh, this is not related to the past. So basically, what I'm trying to say, our future returns not always, or the future distribution of the data not always related with the, or not always same as the historical distribution. That means the past distributions. Okay. The second thing is uh, the ordering of data is very important. So what do you mean by order of the data? Meaning to say, the historical information is completely. Uh, can can uh, we can estimate based upon the order of the data? But if we have the order of the data and information on the ordering of the data, we can predict the future prices. So it will help us to predict the future prices. So I will let you. Uh, I mean, I will give you a much more detailed introduction on this, so you will get aware of what I'm talking about. Right now, it might be very 
you know cloudy what i'm talking about but just listen to me and you will you know you will understand over the period of time that what i'm ta talking about right now so you basically understand two things that the need of conditional heteroskeletal models are required because we so far we have two assumptions the one is future prices can be predicted from the past prices the one assumption which is not always true the second thing is that the parameters of historical distributions are without ancient ordering of the so ordering of the data that plays a very important role for the future predictions okay of course we don't have a tool from uh, where we can you know test the assumption one we don't have any kind of, of uh, statistical tools available but to test the second assumptions we do have the tools from which we can understand the importance of the ordering of the data and if we get the information about the ordering of the data it would be easy for us to predict the future prices so there are two tools one is called the serial correlation and the second is called the volatility clustering in the data okay so let me take you through what is called the serial correlation i hope you have already come across serial correlation throughout this workshop but let me revise it again for the purpose of this particular so uh, what do we mean by the serial correlation so we have two uh, we have basically three types of serial correlation the one is the positive serial correlation second is negative and the third is no serial correlation which is called random walk i hope you all have heard about random walk model in the finance area we very much talk about the random walk in the prices and all so a uh, positive serial correlation are, um, that the uh, the on an average return or let's say prices tends to follow by another above average returns or prices negative serial correlation is an above average returns or prices tends to follow a below average returns or prices meaning to say that if positive correlation means if the one is moving x direction this will also move to the x direction whereas negative serial correlation means one will move x direction Direction, other will move wide. Uh, let's say uh, minus x direction. Okay, so this is called the negative co serial correlation. And no serial correlation is basically when uh, the likelihood of average return does not, uh, you know, followed by the above average return or the below average return. It's a very random. It can be move anywhere, anywhere. The point two points are moving. So there is. So there is no trend that they are going together or they are going in a opposite direction so that is called no serial correlation now what is the importance of the serial correlation in finance so that importance arises from the market efficiency theory i hope you have heard about market efficiency theory which says that the current prices or let's say the observed prices often are said fully reflects all the information available in the market so that is what the ma market efficiency theory says of course there are three categorization weak form semi weak form and the strong form i'm not going into that but uh, because of this context i'm bringing it into the picture so market efficiency says that the observed prices of an asset fully reflects all the information available in the price uh, in the market now the point is if market efficiency theory holds true then what happens suddenly when a new information comes into the market so we see there is a huge change in the prices of the stocks either they go upside or they go downside that is what we call the market is you know that is what every day we are seeing in the newspaper or let's say um, on you know uh, on the financial uh, news that today market has raised uh, tomorrow market is going down and today market is uh, having a bull nature or market is having a bear nature kind of thing so if market efficiency holds true then how this new information is getting absorbed in the prices and then getting sudden reflection in the prices change we never know if today market will end let's say on 23000 we never know whether tomorrow market will open at the same price or whether it will be open up or down we never know about it right but we we are once we see the prices let's say today's 
newspaper when I saw, and if I see that the NSC has gone up, so I will assume that there is a good information which has come to the market because because of that, it has a push for upward direction. But if I see that, uh, oh, today uh, NSC has fallen this much of point, so that means there was some bad news around uh, because of that, uh, you know, which has pushes the prices to go downward directions. So, so meaning to, uh, so I hope you understand what, what is the market efficiency and how this new information coming to the market and it is suddenly changing or suddenly pushing the prices go up. So, gives a very, uh, so since all the information is already discounted in the stock prices, then how come this new information is coming? So definitely it is a surprise to the market. Market is not discounting this uh, in the current prices. And this is a sudden surprise to the market, which leads the prices to go, go up and down. So that, that meaning to say, uh, but we can't tell ahead that whether it would be a good information or bad information after seeing the prices only or after analyzing the trend we can only then understand whether it was a good information or bad information so that meaning to say there is no way to predict the prices to go up and down so that gives a rise to the random walk model i hope you understand how this you know random walk model has evolved from the market efficiency theory. So random walk model says that there is a no way to tell that the prices will go up or down relative to its current prices. And whereas market efficiency theory says that all the information has been discounted to the current prices what we see today. So now, so what is the implications of the random walk model? So we can see the returns uh, so when we see the serial correlations in the uh, stock prices, we find the prices or the returns have very low serial correlations. Thus, the testing serial correlation in the stock return is basically you are testing the market efficiency. Market efficiency says everything is there in the stock prices. That means the current stock prices depending upon the past information. That meaning to say it has a serial correlation. Whereas random work model says that there is no serial correlation between present and the past prices. That is the reason we can't predict the future prices. Okay, so I hope you understand this context. And the, this is the first tool to, you know, test the ordering of the data. And uh, uh, then how do we test the serial correlation? So basically, uh, this is a mathematical formula, formula correlation between present price. Let's say XT denotes the time uh, value of the time series on day T. So we have an autocorrelation formula. Uh, xt and xt minus j that means the lag j uh, whether you wanted to have it for one day uh, past uh, i mean uh, last one day or last to last one day correlation so that is how you you know keep on changing the value of the j and but, uh, the uh, row not basically if you wanted to see the serial correlation of xt with the xt that will always be fun so in the R, we have a function of this uh, serial correlation of testing. We will, uh, we will see it. I will show you the data also. But let me continue with the theory part, and then we will switch to the practical application of it. Uh, so now there is, as I told you, there are two tools to see the ordering of the data. So first is the serial correlation. And second is called the volatility clustering. Now, what is the volatility clustering and conditional heteroscedicity? So volatility clustering, it, it, is, uh, it can be defined in two ways. The first is high volatility clustering, or second is it can have a high volatility clustering, a data can show, or it can also show a low volatility clustering. Now, what do you mean by clustering? Clustering is basically when some information is gathering at one place. So it, it creates a cluster of the information, right? So high volatility clustering tends to be followed by high volatility. That means you find, I'll show you one data where you can see, yeah, yeah you can see this uh, right-hand side graph where you can see the data, uh, you can see the larger, you know, spikes. And then there is a normal series, tend to be normal. And then again, there is a sudden spikes in 2020. So one, you can see near 20, 2008 to 2009, we have a lot of 
you know, uh, uh, observations together. And then nearly 2020, 2019, we have a lot of observations together. So these periods are the high volatility clustering periods. Okay, so these are very, uh, this time series data has a high, uh, high volatility clustering in these two phases. So these two phases, as we know, what were the incident 2008 global financial crisis we had, and it has had the impact on the Indian stock market. And we're now coming to uh, the uh, now co coming to uh, the the observation of volatility clustering in the financial data. So ordering of the data really matters. Now uh, how ordering of the data really matters, and then how this models have evolved. So uh, the point is, if you come to the slide number, uh, come to the slide number uh, twenty one. Can you please uh, show me the slide number 21? So uh, this is again the Nifty 50 return series. Here you can say there is no serial correlation on the original log return series. Okay, now can you come to the uh, slide number 20, uh, 22? Now you can see the volatility clustering in the Nifty 50 returns. You can see there is a high volatility clustering. Why? Because the serial correlation is very, very high. Okay, meaning to say when we how to uh, look into the uh, now how to read the you know autocorrelation graph. So let me first tell you. So in this graph, you can see there are two blue bands. So these two blue bands are nothing but the 95% confidence interval. And these bar which you can see. So if these bar there, they are crossing the blue lines, whether upside or downside. And in a sequence, so you can say there is a high serial correlation. But if you see that they are, the bars, they are not crossing the blue lines and these are very random. So there is no autocorrelation on the serial correlation, right? So as you can see in the slide number 20, can you please switch to slide number 20, 21, sorry, 21. Yeah, so in 21, you can see the the uh, the bar, which more of more, most of the bars are within the 95 con 95 percent con confidence interval. They are not crossing the blue line. So that is the reason. Uh, that is the meaning. You can say they are not having the autocorrelation. OK, and when when you see. So here you can see the volatility clustering is very, very high because here all the bars are going beyond the 95% confidence interval. Now, how do you test the volatility clustering? So that is again a good uh, thing to understand. So uh, for, uh, for the uh, if you if you wanted to see the uh, volatility clustering in the return series, in the return series, then what you have to do, take the absolute value of the return series, okay, and take the autocorrelation function in our model. I will tell you how to do it. So take the absolute value of the return and plot the serial correlation graph. All right, it's a very simple thing. Uh, take a uh, absolute value of the return series and plot the graph of serial correlation. If you find such kind of graph uh, where the bars are going beyond the 95% confidence interval, that says that there is a high volatility clustering. Now, uh, how to cross check whether the ordering of the data is important or not. So for that purpose, what you have to do, you just, you know, randomize the uh, return series. Okay, randomize the return series. Randomize, uh, randomization means uh, we always find the order of the series. Let's say 2008 to 2020, there is the order of the data. There is a sequence of the data, right? But what I'm trying to say you, you randomize that order where the date does not matter. Only you have a return series and you randomize it. Once you randomize the return series and take the absolute of that particular return series. Now, can you please switch to 23rd slide? Yes. Now, when you randomize the return series, see you can see the heading also volatility clustering of Nifty 50 permuted return series. Permuted, permuted means I have randomized it. And there is a function also you can see. I have randomized the return series and then there is an absolute value I've taken and I've plotted the graph. So you can see the autocorrelation function shows that 
the there is no volatility clustering volatility clustering has gone completely so i hope you understand what you mean by the ordering of the data so far i was trying to make you understand the importance of volatility clustering and the ordering of the data so ordering of the data is very very important if you randomize the series you will find there is no autocorrelation and volatility clustering will be gone but if the data is in a order that means we always collect the data from the market which is always in the order that means the information is there present so and that presentation will be shown in the volatility clustering but when we randomize the data uh, the information is gone so when information is gone you cannot predict the future prices correctly or the, let's say the future return series correctly so i hope you understood what you mean by the importance of the volatility clustering and that is the that is why that is why these arch and garch models have a right to capture this that information because see the the ordinary regression model or let's say the ordinary time series models they are unable to capture the information which is present in the time series data which are highly volatile so that brings uh, you know that brings the arch and garch model into the picture to capture that particular information uh, that capture to uh, to capture that particular information now um, i request you to move to slide number uh, slide number 8 yeah so um, this is the same thing which i have discussed so i need not to repeat it again come to the slide number 9 now what are the challenges next next slide slide number 10 10 yeah uh, what are the challenges in modeling financial time series data so, so i have already discussed few points uh, i'm just summarizing everything here so the challenges we have the volatility clustering as i told you then we have a conditional heterostaticity where you find there is a constant variance but then suddenly there is a jump in the volatility so that's again uh, so there in the jump you find a lot of volatility volatilities are clustering together then uh, there is something called called leverage effect what is the leverage effect so basically we say when the market is when the market is down market is falling so we we find that there is a high volatility at that time then the market when then um, the market is rising so that is called the leverage effect down falling market has uh, fall falling market is more volatile as comparison to the rising market so that's called leverage effect then financial time series data usually non normal and it exhibit the flatter tails and excess peakness okay so that is called some that something is called leptokurtosis so we used to we not, most of the time series data they are not normally distributed that is one of the property that we assume in the time series data which is actually not true so most of the time the time series data is more leptokurtosis leptokurtosis means their tails are more flatter and they have the excess peakness once i will take you the example i'll give you the graph and other things so you will visualize and you will understand what it is and why uh, do we need to model the time series data so most of the okay. time when as a asset holder we are interested in modeling the left tails of the financial data or the stock return left tails means we are more interested to know the negative returns that means the loss what we are going to have after holding a portfolio of asset to estimate what is the value at risk and what is the expected shortfalls to uh, so once we are having this so we can discover the potential loss and we can try to avoid those loss so uh, of course these are important at everywhere in the banks when you are a uh, portfolio manager for the mutual funds as a company as a, even individual stockholders so it's very important now coming to the properties of the leptokurtosis this distribution exhibit the flatter tails and they are having excess peakness due to the large number of excessive negative return i'm sorry to mention it here excessive negative returns because we are, we are more interested to the left tail side so leptokurtosis time series data usually have time varying variance that means the clustering will be present and they have the excess kurtosis that means the flat tails so these above features they lead to violation of the homoscedicity as well as uh, autocorrelation of ols model that is the reason the linear models are unable to capture these features of the financial time series data and that is why we need arch and garch model 
Now coming to the next slide, number eleven. Hello, madam. Yes. Madam, uh, as we know, the time series process uh, involves a data generating process that is a stochastic process. That means a yes. sequence of random variables. Those are ordered in time. Hmm. Ma'am, uh, okay. how uh, do uh, uh, can you please just explain how the variables are random? I I got the uh, idea of uh, how they are ordered in time. You just explain, but a sequence of random variables, as we say, how the variables are going to be random? Okay, or so random uh, instead of random, can we use the word permute? You can make a different permutation of the given series. Because I think random word is confusing you again and again. But can we see? Can we say we have a time series data from two thousand eight to two thousand twenty? So there is a one kind of permutation of the data. Uh, once we make a different kind of permutation of the data. Okay, data. I hope you understand the permutation, right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, so if we take a different kind of permutation of the data, and then if you check the autocorrelation of that absolute value, you will find your uh, volatility clustering is gone. So instead of saying the randomization, I think it's confusing, um, maybe most of you. So we can say permutation of the data. Okay, okay. therefore, can can we have this concept like this? Like, uh, like uh, suppose we are having a data of from two thousand and two thousand and up to two thousand and twenty. 20 years okay. data we are having suppose this is the okay. population okay. okay from this population can we draw samples in a randomized fashion like 2008 to 2020 then 2006 to 2020 But that okay. randomization, yeah, that is the random. Okay, that you are right. That we select the random sample. Okay, that is called sampling technique. I am not talking about sampling technique. That is the random sampling that you are randomly selecting. Let's say from two thousand six to two thousand twenty, or let's say two thousand ten to two thousand twenty. Okay, that is called random sampling. There are different different methods of sampling, right? Choosing the data or choosing the sample out of population. But here, what I am trying to tell you. You, that here when we are you know permuting the data the order does not matter uh, in your case when you are selecting the data let's say from 2010 to 2020 out of the population 2008 to 2020 that is again in order 2010 to 2020 again in a order right hello yes ma'am am i right to you um uh, may i know your good name please Ma'am Shantanu Ghosh. Shantanu, Shantanu, sir, can we discuss this uh, again? If you have any further doubt, we can discuss this. We will. I would love to take this. But shall we move forward? Otherwise, you know what will happen? Yes, Time yes, will yes. lapse, and we won't be able to do anything further. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Sure, ma'am. Okay. Don't mind. I will take all your questions. I would love to answer your, uh, you know, queries. But we will do it maybe offline or okay, you know. Okay. That, that's okay. fine because yeah. the time constraint sure yeah time is less and again from my end there is a lot of issues of the network okay uh, okay all right so that is what now coming to the point uh, somebody says that okay we already have lot of volatilities you know how to measure the volatility somebody says the standard deviation and variance so these are the two measures to measure the volatility correct these are the two measures to uh, to measure the volatility but then what is the problem in the historical volatility why do we need to have a conditional volatility model we already have the historic historical volatility measures available so the point is what happened when we are having a historical volatility model like some uh, like there is something called rolling standard deviation so what is the challenge with the rolling standard deviation calculation that is again depends upon the historical data historical volatility it will use so what it does it uses the equal weights for all the cases means more recent observation should be given more relevant weight and others would be given the less so again there would be a partiality in the data and it might not able to capture the uh, let's say particular observation which is important for our prediction so there is the flaws with the historic historical volatility uh, uh, you know uh, or what we can say tools and it also use uh, there is also the issue of the overlapping of the observation which lead to the correlations issues so these are few things which you know uh, which further uh, give a more uh, a more weightage to the arch and gauge model 
So shall we move forward for the next slide? 12, slide number 12. Yes. So in this part two, we will discussing the arch and garch model. I would be see uh, garch model, arch model, these area are very, very vast. We have the combinations of the model, but most of the time the standard garch model, garch one one model with normal distribution or with the skewed student T distribution or with the student T distribution are more uh, sometimes works more efficiently then we can use the asymmetric gauge model we can see asymmetric gauge model so i'm not going to cover all the cases but i'll give you a hint how to you know understand which model is good which model is not good which model you have to look forward so uh, shall we move forward for the introduction part uh, slide number 13 yes uh, so, ARCH model was proposed, proposed by the Robert Engel in 1982 and its full form is autoregressive conditional heteroscedicity model. So, according to the ARCH model, the error term at time t depends on the squared error terms from the previous period. So, uh, here the volatility, basically in this model, the volatility does not depends upon the past volatility. It only depends upon the innovation term. Innovation term is nothing but the error term we, we used to say. So there are three equations. The one is the mean equation. Second is uh, the variance equation. And third is called the distribution model. So variance model, we have a mean uh, plus the error term. So MT is the constant. And then you have the third equation, which is the, uh, which uh, here it is written for with the variance equation. So variance equation, you can see uh, the variance is depending upon the past value or the lag value of the error term. We don't have any kind of past variance term, right? So this is our arch model. So arch one model, how do we define? It's a sigma square t is equal to alpha naught plus alpha one, e square t minus one. So only one past value we are adding. So this is arch one model. Arch two model would be sigma square t is equal to alpha naught plus alpha one, e square t minus one plus e square t minus two. That means two means we have a two two lag values added. Uh, arch three model means we are adding three lag values of error term. So this is how it goes, right? Then you can see uh, what is the unconditional variance of the arch model. So this is also given. And uh, then we have the conditional variance. So uh, these are, you know, more mathematical and technical terms. So I'm not going to discuss these things because it would be difficult otherwise to under make you understand. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Let's discuss the Garch model. Okay, so a uh, Garch model is basically the full name is generalized autoregressive conditional heteroscedicity model. And uh, this generalized autoregressive uh, conditional heteroscedicity model is used for the analyzing time series data which are volatile. Okay, so I have given Garch 1 1 model. Garch 1 1 model, we have a three format mean equation, variance equation, and distribution model. So, mean model is nothing but we have a return is equals to expected return, which is alpha naught, and this is the constant plus variance and uh, multiplied by error term. Okay, then we have a variance equation. So here the variance equation is uh, depending upon the error term as well as your variance, past value of the variance. So that is the difference between arch and garch model that it also depends upon the past value of volatility. And then you have a distribution model. So we assume the error term is void noise. That means it is distributed as a normally and having a mean zero and, va and variance one. So, uh, okay, one more thing in the variance equation, this error term we called arch effect and this when we add this H T minus one, that is nothing but the variance that is called the Garch effect. Okay, now Garch in mean model, I'm just telling you the equation right now. So I'll give you hands on practice also, don't worry about that. So Garch in mean model, basically we are adding the variance in the mean equation. That is the only difference. You can see there is no further difference, only the difference we are adding the variance in the mean equation. So these are the two different model uh, which we use. Uh, basically we use Garch 1 1 model most of the time. Uh, coming to the next slide. Okay, so uh, this is called a student T Garch model. So in this student T Garch model, now uh, you can see the mean equation and variance equation, they both are same. 
but only the distribution model is different. Now, distribution model means uh, in the previous model, we, we were assuming the error term is having a white noise distribution. That means error term is normally distributed, right? But when we are saying a uh, student T gauge model, so we say the error term is not uh, normally distributed. It is having a T distribution, right? Why there is a T distribution and why it is not normally distributed, as I already discussed you before, most of the time series data, they are not normal by nature. They are not normally distributed. Uh, they are having their leptokurtosis. That means they are having a fatter tail and they are, they, are pe they, are, they are having excess peakness. So which distribution defines, defines it best? That is a T-shaped distribution. So that is what called a student t gauge model. That is sometimes much better than the normal, normal model if you are using. Okay, so I will tell you how to calculate that also. Going to the next slide. Uh, now, coming to the asymmetric gauge model, that is also very, uh, very much, uh, you know, useful and important in day to day basis. So basically what it says, often the downward movements in the market are highly volatile than the upward movement of the same magnitude. So I told you, I defined that it is called a leverage effect in the market. That means market does not consider bad news and good news equally. Okay. Uh, it has an impact. I mean, it has a differential impact on the market. If it is the good news, market will go up, but it will be going gradually. But if it is the bad news, it will market will go down and the declining market have is more volatile as comparison to the rising market and market declines much faster than the rising market. The reason being uh, the reason is selling. So when what happened when the market is declining, there is a lot of short selling also happens in the market. So because of that, the price falls further. Even the people, those who are having their stocks with them, they feel that the market is going down and they wanted to sell it out and come out of the market. So uh, that is the reason you, when the market falls, it is highly volatile. When the prices are going up, nobody goes and buy the share immediately and number of people will not go and buy the share. But when the market is falling, everybody thinks that their money is going to shrink. So they will go and sell it off, sell it off, sell it off. So when market, then everybody is going and selling it off. So what will happen? The prices will for, further come down. So that is the, you know, that is called asymmetric effect of good and bad news in the, uh, uh, in the market. So you can see uh, the good news part, the curve of the good news that is gradually increasing, but bad news part that's, you know, exponential, that, that's a decline exponentially or, you know, there's a fast declining as comparison to the rising market. All right. So these are the two things. And then uh, we will move further to the next slide. I'm sorry. Uh, hello. Hello. Yeah. Next it's, slide. Next slide. Next. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, okay. Fine. Yeah. Now, uh, types of asymmetric gauge models. So we have a T gauge and we have, you know, T gauge is the threshold guard and then we have exponential gauge model. So uh, there is a small change in the equation. You should not worry about the equation and should not fear with the equation. Equations are just the notation to, you know, describe the model. So you should not fear about. You can see mean equation is same as what we are keep on seeing since the beginning. It's a uh, return is equals to alpha naught, which is, you know, excess return plus uh, under root of HT. Under root of HT is nothing but HT is a sigma square. So when we take the under root of HT, that will become a standard deviation. And then we have an error term. Okay, so this is the mean equation and this is same all around the model we have seen. Now coming to the variation uh, va variance equation. So Gauge model is always, you know, tweak around the variance equation either or uh, around the distribution model. So most of the time you have to tweak between the variance equation and the distribution model. So variance equation says that uh, my past volatility will be depending upon the lag value of the past volatility as well as the lag value of the error term. And then we have one information, you know, the, this term, asymmetric effect term. So that is lambda uh, lambda multiplied by uh, e, uh, uh, epsilon squared t minus 1 d t minus 1 okay so this if uh, this term will be capturing your asymmetric effect so how it will be capturing the asymmetric effect if lambda lambda is equals to 0 
okay let's say lambda is equals to 0 so if lambda is equals to 0 what will happen only this we will be getting only three terms in the in the equation st is equals to alpha naught plus beta 1 ht minus 1 plus alpha 1 uh, epsilon square t minus 1 so this equation is very familiar to us this is called gauge 1 1 equation right so uh, if lambda is equals to zero, I'm talking about that says there is no asymmetric effect of noise. There is a symmetric gauge model. This is called a symmetric gauge model, or you can say the standard gauge model, right? But if lambda is in, if lambda is non-zero, so that is called symmetric gauge model. When lambda is non not zero and lambda is greater than zero, okay, there are two conditions which I am going to satisfy together. Lambda is greater than greater than zero, okay. So when lambda is greater than zero, what will happen? That reflect the bad news, okay. That reflect the leverage effect. That means the bad news increases the volatility. Are you getting my point? So when lambda is less than zero. It shows there is an impact, there is an asymmetric effect, but if lambda is greater than zero, it says that the there is a leverage effect. That means the market is fa falling, there is a in high volatility in the market because of the bad news. So no, these madam. are the two, yes. Madam, uh, can we say that lambda is a representation of the market sensitivity? No, market sensitivity is different thing. That's the beta. It means the reaction actually, basically the market reaction. Because uh, if we just uh, assume that lambda is zero, the whole model yes. is gauge one one. Yes, the yes. The function is of lambda actually. Basically, it is inserting the information of the uh, the sentiments of yes, the market. Yes, inserting the information is actually market sensitivity. We will not say otherwise it will be confused with the Kappa model. Yes, okay. yes, yes. <laughs> So, lambda is basically capturing the asymmetric effect of information. Sure, sure. Am I right? That means the degree, degree of asymmetry can be uh, represented by that lambda actually. Degree, not degree. Uh, we should be very careful the words what we choose. <laughs> so, degree we, 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 we cannot say. It's because it's nowhere it's going to measure the degree of, uh, you know, whether it's a bad news or good news. But yes, it says that there is a leverage effect or there is no leverage effect. So, leverage effect would be when lambda is greater than zero, there would be a leverage effect. If lambda is equal to zero, there is no leverage effect or there is there is no at all asymmetric uh, effect of the noise it would be gauge one one model am i right okay ma'am. okay okay fine let's move forward to the next slide yes uh next is called exponential gauge model so there is a small difference between t gauge and e gauge so in exponential gauge model basically we present the equation in the logarithmic form and we say there is an exponential change change in the market or exponential change in the volatility when there is a news arise if it is the positive or negative right so you can see log ht we have the mean equation again same so you should not worry about mean equation until unless you want to tweak it of course, there are variant of the mean equations, but I am taking a very simple example of uh, of mean equation, which is constant alpha naught plus. We have again the variance and uh, uh, error term. Now coming to the variance equation, so we are having uh, log of uh, volatility is equals to alpha naught plus beta one log of lag term of the volatility plus. And then we have this epsilon naught. Uh, epsilon t minus 1 and the expectations of epsilon t minus 1 that is also one term plus the uh, lambda again there is a lambda so that will again capture uh, equation is more or less similar there is a little difference but effect of lambda is same again here if the lambda is positive there would be a leverage effect or we will say the bad news increasing the volatility a lambda is less than zero there would be news impact which would be asymmetric and if lambda is equals to zero we will be having again gauge one one model kind of thing so here the log of conditional variance equation shows the leverage effect is exponential than the quadratic so starch uh, uh, this starch model or we can say the threshold gauge model that's that says the behavior is quadratic equation uh, in terms of quadratic equation whereas the log terms when we are adding we are saying the leverage effect is exponential so only this is the difference in you know gauge uh, tarch and uh, uh, e gauge model now coming to the third part 
So let me just take you through some graphs which I've plotted uh, from R and if time permits, I will take you through R also. Otherwise, we will do in the next session. All right. Uh, so uh, the first series, you can see we have a, a nifty 50 time series. So this is the simple plot, simple, you know, time series plot of the nifty 50. Then what I did, I plotted the log return. Most of the time we are interested in the log return, returns uh, or the log returns of the series. So when I plotted this log return series, so first of all, what will happen? It will remove all the trend and it will make the series more stationary, right? Because here in this series, you can see there is a volatility, which I can see, but at the same time, there is a trend in the variance I can see, and the series is also non-stationary. I hope you have studied stationary, non-stationary part. Uh, so in this series, what I found that most of the time it is moving around the average, but at 2008-2009, we find a lot of observations are peaking up and down. And near 2019-20, there are again observations which are falling apart from the average line. Okay, so this is my return series. So after seeing this return series, what I got a hunch, I'm just telling you the process how to identify where I have to go for Gatch modeling or you, you have to go for ordinary least square or maybe some other time series modeling. So when I see this series, I got a hunch that there is a volatility clustering around 2008-9 period and in around 2019-20 period, uh, there is a volatility clustering. Now, I want to confirm whether this volatility clustering is there or not, or uh, how do I confirm then? Uh, so first, next slide. Yeah, so first I will check the simple serial correlation on the log return series. So what I found, there is no serial correlation in the log return series. So if there is no serial correlation, okay, fine. Uh, so uh, still I don't know what to do with this series. If I don't know what to do with this series, I will check the volatility clustering. I wanted to confirm whether volatility clustering is present or not. See, uh, 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 observation is one part, but statistical proof is the second part. So observation I observed, yes, there, there are some kind of volatility clustering around, uh, you know, series, but I want to static, statistically confirm whether there is a presence or not. So first I will check a normal serial correlation on the return series. So what I found, there is no serial correlation. It says that there is a random walk model. So that uh, theory applies in the financial time series data that is proven. Next, next slide. Yeah, so when I run the volatility clustering to confirm the volatility clustering, yeah. when what I, what I did, Madam. I have taken, yes. Madam, can you go to slide 20, please? Uh, 20, can you please come to the slide 20? Yes. Uh, the data, uh, Madam, the data here is on price series in Nifty 50 in the left hand side, isn't that? Yes, yes, yes. And, and we can uh, see that the data is uh, non stationary as it is hiking up, actually. Yes, 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 uh, non stationary yes. completely. So, to, to make it stationary, where we can use the log series as well as we can difference the series also. Correct, correct. You are right. See, only uh, if you if you see the difference, what is the difference meaning? Difference is basically the current observation minus the first of observation. Exactly. Exactly. And if you remember when I when we take the log of the return, log of the return is what? We are taking uh, some what what we are doing. We are uh, log of let's say present price divided by the past price. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Right. So uh, log of the I should not go into it, the mathematical part. Sorry. Yes, yes. It, is, it is actually the indexing formula actually. Log using yeah, the log indexing formula. Indexing formula, and this is actually right. in absolute terms. Absolute Different terms. In absolute terms. Correct. But the impact so, will be somehow similar. Yes, but the point is most of the time, if you take the log of the data, actually what why this concept came log of the data, apart from the financial series, even if you have the even if you have some kind of economic indicators, okay. So if that data is available in absolute terms, if you take the log of the series, it will smooth the series. Sure. So if there is a component of a stationarity that will uh, non stationarity that will go automatically. So that is the first thing what we'll do. First, we will take the log of the series. But after that's taking that's the log of the series, yeah, after uh, even after taking the log of the series, if 
there is non stationarity present that will be confirmed by adf test or pp test or kps test uh, there are tests auto auto decay fuller test and all so once they will confirm there is still non stationary present then what will we what we will be doing we will again take the difference of the series are you getting okay. my point Yes, so first, yes, first, first thing is let us do something very simple, which is the log. Even economic indicator series we are having, so we use find the trend and all. So when we take the log, it will smooth the series. So automatically, non-stationary part will be gone. But again, if the test are confirming there is a stationarity, non-stationarity available in the data through ADF or PP test, then we will we take the difference. The series. Yeah, we then we will be differencing the series. Okay. Okay, ma'am. Okay. Now, uh, coming to the clustering part, yeah, volatility clustering part. Uh, can you go upside 20 second? Yeah, 20 second one. So, uh, I want to confirm my volatility clustering in this series. So, what I will be doing, I have a return series. I will uh, I will take the absolute term of the return series. Now, can some, I mean, you might be wondering why I'm taking the absolute term. Uh, the reason being the variance is always positive. Am I right? Variance is always positive. Yeah. Standard deviation can have plus minus sign. You can say plus minus sigma, but variance, which is sigma square, that is always positive. Correct. So, uh, absolute term will remove the negative returns. Uh, basically, what I'm trying to say, it will, you know, Remove, I will only take the mag, uh, magnitude of the data. I will not take sign. I will not consider the sign. Okay. And then I will run the ACF plot. And then what I will find, my all the observations are crossing the blue barrier, which is the 95% confidence interval, which says that my data has volatility clustering. I hope this part I, I'm clear with. Okay, so these are the two things: observing the volatility clustering and uh, uh, then uh, statistically to prove that there is a volatility clustering available. Now coming to twenty fourth slide, madam. Twenty four. Yes, madam. As we yes, are yes. ignoring the signs actually in the twenty second slide, uh, yes. we are basically trying to avoid the signs and uh, uh, try to map the. Uh, magnitude of the effect. So can't Correct. we use variance instead of the absolute value? Uh, see, you there are you can also do a square. You can square the log of return series. You can't use variance. See, variance only one observation you would be getting. Okay, variance is what you have the data from two thousand eight to two thousand twenty. Let's say, okay, uh, yes, when you calculate only... the variance. So it would be one value, right? One statistic value, yes, yes. Yeah, one is statistical value, right? But I wanted to see volatility clustering in the data itself. In the then only, itself. Huh, then, so what you can do, instead of taking the absolute value of the return, you can square the returns. That will also remove your, you know, positive or uh, negative sign once you are squaring the data. But what will happen, the magnitude will become larger. larger. Because you are squaring it up. The impact will be increased. Yeah, impact will be increased, and then you will see, of course. But you will find the same features will be available. De definitely, you will be having all these observations crossing the blue lines. Okay, but only the thing is because you have magnified the things uh, in in terms of numbers because you are squaring it up. So uh, first, I mean, uh, uh, before squaring it up, I think it's a lot more easier to take the absolute value. Okay. Okay. Because in both the way, our purpose purpose is to remove the negative sign. So what is the first tool in hand? I have absolute. Uh, I have the modular, so I can use and the absolute. Uh, you know values. This, this this value is basically a type of diagnostic check that uh, we are going to see that whether there is volatility clustering or not. Yes. 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 Correct. Correct. Because because ma'am, if we use absolute value, then mathematical operations can be quite uh, harder for uh, rather. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. This is completely for the diagnostic check. That absolute values we are not going to use in the model. This sure, is sure. only for the volatility for clustering checking. Okay. okay, I I okay. have never used absolute log return yes. anywhere in the model. It's the model, always okay. been the original log returns. 
okay it which you will be getting it purpose. yes this is only for the ident and identification purpose you okay know. okay okay fine uh, coming to slide number 24 yes so let us begin with the uh, you know i hope so far you understood what is the arch and garch model what is the purpose of arch mo uh, garch model why we are going for garch model though we have the variety of other time series modeling but i hope uh, the purpose of this today's uh, topic was to make you understand the importance of the garch model why do we go for the garch model what is the need of the garch model so till the point whatever i have discussed the, the information which i have accumulated from the various sources and tried to synthesize to present you in one hour uh, just to give you insight the importance of the garch model i think i have uh, delivered it that when you have the data time series data which is highly volatile and where the order also matters a lot you wanted to predict the future volatility of the data and uh, when you see the time series data which is highly volatile then then it is not normally distributed the garch model comes into the picture because you have to go for conditional heteroscedicity models modeling okay and there there the garch model comes into the picture this is the entire purpose of uh you know this entire presentation only two three lines uh, i can uh, if you want to summarize you can summarize well. now uh, the main important i hope uh, everybody is uh, more interested in knowing how to model arch and garch in the r software so uh, first of all what we have we have a library of univariate garch model let me again tell you uh, there is univariate garch model and there is a multivariate garch modeling also so i have not gone through the multivariate garch modeling i'm just sticking with the univariate garch modeling so far so uh, we have library called uh, ugarch which is for the univariate garch model and uh, garch model specification in r is defined as the ugarch spec so uh, okay so my first library is when you wanted to access any of the financial data directly from the you know from the online so there is a library called quant mode and then we have some other library but i am more, more interested to tell you that uh, garch modeling library so in the r model first of all you have to install the package and then you have to run the library though i have already installed but for your convenience i am just typing it again so this is the you know uh, 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 this is the command for uh, <clears throat> installing the package okay so you can run this and then you can run the library so so when i am running the install packages you can see uh, that this model is getting installed and then we have a library are you guys okay a uh, rest of the files i also run okay fine now uh, so in this uh, application i have taken one apple stock okay apple daily stock prices i have taken i have taken it from 2008 to 2020 so uh, this is the library for this is the function for uh, getting online data for the apple stock you can say the get symbols and then you can type like that i will share you the code don't worry about it you just be very uh, you know free your mind and you just listen to me right now and then you have a chart series so there you can pl plot the chart you can see there is a plot okay there is a plot available and but i'm more interested to see see the closing price you can see the apple once i uh, just a second so when i would be doing this so i i want i'm more interested to see the closing price so i've run the closing price you can see here you can see the closing price data of the apple okay now you can see in this part also you can see this data is it visible to all of you so you can see this apple stock price which i have taken from 2008 to 2020 here you can see we have a jumps okay we have jump and this side we have a lot of jumps so definitely what i am assuming that there is a volatility clustering in this point in near somewhere 2019 20 okay i find this is more in this point then there are some clustering in this point 2015 16 and then 2012 and 13 okay so now going back to the uh, just to confirm statistically whether this is present or not uh, first let me calculate the return of the closing price let me first calculate the return 
So I will run this one. So it has calculated return. So my return series is calculated. I wanted to see the heads of my return series. Okay, I'll show you the heads of my return. So you can see, this is my Apple closing price, 2008. This is only header, okay? It's not the entire data. Just to show you, this, these are my return series of Apple closing price, okay? Now, I wanted to see the histogram of returns. So this is my histogram for the return series. Now, you can see, after seeing the histogram, what you can identify, this data is not normal. Okay, this is my observation. This data is not normal. Again, what I, I will do, I will plot normal curve T distribution uh, here in this plot. So this will give me more clear understanding about it. Just a way. Now, now look at this data. Can you see that all of you? Yeah. Yes. No? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, fine. This red red chart. Okay. So basically this red chart, it talks about the normal curve. Okay, this green chart talks about uh, the uh, T distribution, the fitted, actually the fitted distribution, not T, the fitted distribution. And this blue line, this shows, uh, this shows about the density, density of, this, the, uh, of this data. So you can see uh, uh, the green line, green line is more fitting to the uh, actual data than the red line. Red line is a normal curve. You can see here the green line, which is, I think you are able to see that the green line is much more fitting to the data than the red line, right? So first assumption, which I visualize uh, statistically, again, I can say that this is not normally distributed. My data is not normally distributed. Uh, but after seeing this peak, um, you know, excess peak and flatter tails, what I can say, T distribution would be fitted in this data. Okay, because this this is leptokurtosis. This is showing this data is showing the leptokurtosis properties. It is having high peak, and this is having flatter tails. Okay, so this is one observation. Okay, now now this is my return series. Okay, now you can see after seeing the return series, what you can analyze. I think this will give you a clear picture. Uh, now you can analyze, we have a lot of volatility clustering. You can see around 2008, 2009, then around 2019, 2020. So we have, and then around there also we have somewhere 2012, 13. So uh, on an average, it is near, uh, on an average, it is, you can see around the zero, uh, but there are observations which are, you know, going beyond, uh, you know, those are going away from the mean line. So there are there is a volatility clustering I can assure. Okay, now uh, what I wanted to do. Okay. All right. So uh, now this is my gauge model. So how do we write the equation? You can just have a glimpse. So we have a library called UGARCH, as I told you. Then we have a function called UGARCH spec. Okay. In UGARCH spec, if you remember, we had three equations. One is called variance equation, mean equation, and then we have a distribution model. Okay. So here we present it as a variance model, mean model, and distribution model. So variance model, how do we write? We write list model. A standard gauge because we are using gauge one one model so we write a standard gauge gauge order is one one then we write the we will specify the mean model mean model we will write arima term arima order is zero comma zero we are not using any uh, uh you know auto regressive moving average uh terms here it's a constant mean model okay it's a constant mean model the equation which i presented you in the ppt the same thing which i'm writing i'm not including any rma order term okay and then we have a distribution model you can see it here this is the norm normal norm means normal distribution so here i am specifying norm okay when i run this model okay so i'm running this model here just a second this pop up i run this model now i need to fit this model so for fitting this model there is an 
no two with gauge fit equation there is another equation u gauge fit so in u gauge fit i would there are two parameters which we need to give first is the spec is equals to n which i have already run before and then data i need to give my data series so data is my return i will run this model also and then i will just uh, see the output so this is my output can you see that output everybody because now the important parts begin can you see all of you yes yes we can see okay okay now the gauge model fit this is my output now this is very important part of course the r coding and all you will get online also or i will also share but how to read the output that's important so my gauge model is a standard gauge 1 1 model mean model is constant mean model because all the arima term is zero uh, distribution model it is normally distributed mod model which i have used in my data now these are the optimal parameters mu omega alpha and beta now mu stands for if you remember the mean equation it was rt is equals to a not plus under root of ht error term t okay so that mu mu specify the a not the constant excess mean that represent the excess mean in the return equation omega omega represent the second variance model in the variance model we have sigma square t is equals to uh, alpha not plus beta 1 ht minus 1 plus alpha 1 error square t minus 1 right so alpha not the constant term in the variance equation that represent by omega okay okay omega represents that constant term alpha 1 represent the uh, coefficient of error term you can write it down somewhere uh, so alpha 1 represent the coefficient of error term which is epsilon square t minus 1 if you remember in the equation and beta 1 represent the volatility lag coefficient understood so uh, once again i am repeating mu represent the a not which is the excess return in the return equation in the mean equation okay uh, omega represent the constant term in the variance equation alpha 1 represent the error term coefficient and beta 1 represent the volatility pass the lag volatility co coefficient okay so these you, these are the four parameters we have now you look at the p uh, p probability value so these all are zero that says that the all the coefficients are significant okay these all coefficients are significant so basically if i see the beta 1 it is 0.8405 let's say 0.84 so that means our present volatility volatility the current volatility will depends upon the past value which is 0.84 i mean 0.84 uh, uh, sigma square t minus 1 so this is the high domination like it, it depends upon the past volatility so that itself shows there is a volatility clustering because our basic the basic pillar was uh, in the volatility clustering there is serial correlation volatility clustering have the serial correlation past value depends upon present value depends upon the past value and you can see in the model output that our present value of the volatility depends upon the past value and which is very very high in domination right 0.84 then it is again depending upon the error term which is 0.12 of course there are few innovations which are left out so that is again present that is the impact of the news okay something which is not captured by the past volatility which is coming very sudden to the market or which is shocking to the market this is captured by epsilon term and there is the coefficient alpha okay so this is something innovation or idiosyncratic news or you can say idiosyncratic factors which are you know getting absorbed by or are getting impact uh, or they are impacting to the uh, our uh, current volatility so uh, there are robustness uh, standard error these all are significant we need not to look for i mean worry about that now coming to the information criteria so when you run multiple models yeah. what will how do you identify which model is yeah. the good one yes 
madam uh, can you please uh, re, uh, go for the beta 1 explanation it is basically the past volatility coefficient of the error term yes no 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 past volatility of the uh, sorry past volatility uh, not volatility first of all i got confused after listening it's uh, uh, it's a it's a coefficient of the past volatility this is how we say it's a sigma square t minus 1 or do you remember the equation if you have the uh, i mean i did not share the ppt but uh, you remember the h t minus 1 term right yes yes ma'am yes, ma h and uh, epsilon term yes not epsilon yes. e term one uh, is the term actually there were two terms in the variance model the one well, see the, how it goes I'll, I'll i'll tell you i'll tell you once again just hold for a while it's the h t is equals to alpha naught plus beta one h t minus one this is the past volatility plus alpha one e minus one let's say i'm saying e square minus one instead of epsilon i'm saying e square minus one for your convenience so this beta one is basically the coefficient of past volatility which is represented by h t minus one am i under am i clear yes ma'am okay so basically our current volatility in the various model what we are modeling basically we are modeling the volatility right we are modeling the current volatility so that we can project the future volatility of the return or let's say stock prices or the time series so in the variance model our present volatility will depends on two terms first is my past volatility it will depend and other is the error term it will be depending so error term coefficient is alpha 1 which is 0.12 okay and past volatility coefficient is 0.84 so what i'm trying to say the arch model it says telling me that there is a volatility clustering and there is a lot of serial correlation my present volatility is depend on the past volatility which is thing but the 0.84 are you getting my point and rest yes, of the rest of the volatility is depending upon the idiosyncratic idiosyncratic news in the market or idiosyncratic factors in the market which is 0.12 so my present volatility e is that most of the alpha madam that is alpha one term is basically the e term e term e term E term is nothing but the error term, or we also called is the innovation or idiosyncratic news or us or or any news, any shock to the market which is not absorbed. Are you getting my point? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So error term is what? What is error? Error is something which is not being captured by the model or which is not present in the data. Okay. Uh, okay, ma'am. Is... Ma'am. Ma Hello. Yes. Yes, ma'am. The present variance is mm. equal to the constant term. Mm -hmm. Then the coefficient of the previous volatility. That means H T minus one. Correct. Correct. That is that I denote by beta one. Beta one. And the coefficient that is alpha one of the previous error term. Of the previous error term. Correct. Correct. Okay, that is the alpha. That is the alpha. I hope you understood now. Yes, Correct. yes, 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 yes. Okay. Yes, yeah. So what I'm trying to say that our beta coefficient is very much dominating, right? That means our present volatility is depending most of the time and heavily depending upon the past value of the uh, of the volatility. Correct. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so here you can see the volatility clustering is coming into the picture. How they... let the ma'am complete the uh, then we will have a discussion. I think let ma'am complete. There is a good discussion okay. going on. Maybe you can yeah, I think, okay. yeah, okay. I think it would be better. So, okay. what I was, uh, yeah, so what I'm I, I understand this is really interesting, and uh, you know, uh, the point is. Uh, it's also tough to understand for the people, but that's okay. We are here. We will discuss, and uh, we have a next session also. Uh, we'll discuss in detail. Uh, oh, okay. Nah. Go so on with the AI. Sorry. Ma'am, go on on AIC. Hello. You are talking on AIC. Huh? Yes, ma'am. You are talking on AIC, na? Yeah, 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 AIC criteria. So we are talking about information criteria. So these information criteria are very much important. 
So when you have a uh, multiple models, if you're running the multiple model, let's say you're running GARCH 1-1 one, one model, then you also run GARCH in mean model, then you also run GARCH, you know, let's say GARCH is student T model, instead of normal variant, you are running the student T variant. So how do you identify which model is the best fitted for you? You will always find some parameters here and there would be some parameters, some values will be there. So first you have to look at the uh, probability value of the parameters, whether the coefficients which you are getting are significant or not. So if the probability value is zero, that means you are saying that your coefficients are significant because null hypothesis is coefficients are not significant. Okay, so rejecting null hypothesis and you are accepting the alternative hypothesis. And the second thing is looking at the information criteria. So you should have these values should be lower for the other models or any of the model which has the lowest values of the information criteria, that model is much more efficient than the, uh, the other competitive one. Okay, so these are the things. And the third thing which I would like to share with you, yes. Now coming to the standard residual test. So you can see the null hypothesis says no. So this is called the diagnosis of the model. So where there you have the residuals and you will be running some test. And then you wanted to see whether the model is best fitted or not, whether the model is consistent and compat uh, compatible or not. So for the residual test, you will understand whether the models residuals are proper or they are not they are normally distributed first of all they they should not have any serial correlation okay so here the null hypothesis says no serial correlation your p values are above five percent right so you can accept the null hypothesis that means there are no serial correlation your residuals are fine your residuals are not serially correlated so this is the one thing you you will be checking now other important thing you wanted to check is the goodness of it okay so that goodness of fit will test uh, will will tell you whether the model is the good fit or not or there is any scope for model improvement so here if your p value is greater than 5% then you will accept the model is good fit but if your p value is less than 5% let's say here the p values are very less near to zero so that 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 says that there is a scope of model improvement Okay, and these all things, if you, you know, if you write down in the paper and if you try to make a flow chart, you will understand we have sometimes back, we have seen here, just a second, we have seen by you, by seeing the histogram, uh, if you remember this, this one, yeah, by seeing this graph, we understood that the normal distribution will not be fitted. And so far, I run the Garch 1 1 model with the normal distribution. And my model also says there is a scope for the model improvement. Okay. And from the histogram also, I'm understanding that the normal curve will not, normal curve is not fitting. So there is a scope for the other model, uh, you know, to build upon and then to predict the future prices or let's say future returns. So here, the next session which I would be using, I would be using the student T distribution and some other models also I would be using. And then today, what I would be doing, I would be floating you some case or let's say some research paper which you can study. And then I will give you a small case based upon the today's discussion. Let's see how far you are able to identify uh, or you are, you know, able to implement those things.